I'd like to open the sermon with a prayer, a sung prayer. So if you know the song, uh, please sing. Please sing along. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Um, so today's preaching topic is one that I don't have tons of personal experience with, um, which is the peace of God. The peace that surpasses understanding, as Paul calls it, puts it in his reading from today. Now it's true that a lot of times my sermons often cover ground where I don't have a lot of personal experience. Um, I don't have a direct personal experience with first century Judaism, for example, but I preach about that fairly often. Uh, but this is different. Since as a pastor, I feel like I should be able to say, oh, this is what the peace of God is like, and here are the steps you need to take to get there, and here's what I did to achieve it. Um, right? But I, I, sadly, I cannot check that life accomplishment off of my list, at least not in any permanent, long-term kind of way. The thing is that it's much easier to get caught up in a list of things to do and things that should have gotten done but didn't, and a list of people that I should be talking to but I'm not, and all the things that, and all the conversations that went wonky, and the plans that went sideways, and all the things that could go wrong. And for many of us, it gets even worse because of some bigger trauma or struggle that's going on, some grief or sickness or slog that keeps everything off balance. And then when something incomprehensible shows up on the news, the premeditated deaths of children by a determined assassin, or just the day-to-day -day news of war, um, all kinds of things. At that point, I don't really watch the news anymore, honestly, because it's usually somebody getting... Anyway, they like to follow fires. Um, and at that point, it's very hard to believe that the peace of God, this peace that surpasses understanding, could be anything other than one of Paul's rhetorical flourishes. And yet, and yet, I somehow can't help but feeling that Paul is telling us something important about God and about our relationship with God that could give us a path out of worry and into warm and trusting faith. At least some of the time. He says, In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So it could be that I'm imagining the peace of God wrong. As something that's like a drug, like Valium or something. Let me also say I don't have a lot of personal experience with Valium. But it has a reputation for calming people down, for making a stable mood and washing away anxiety. But... Also for, for numbing you. And I, I wonder, would the peace of God really keep us from feeling pain and sorrow and from experiencing sadness and anger in the face of terrible atrocities? Would the peace of God leave us numb to the real hurts of real people in our lives? I'm thinking, no. Instead, I'm guessing that this peace that surpasses understanding is like a tree's roots, well-grounded in trust for God. When we are firmly rooted, we can sway with the winds, whatever they are. That doesn't mean that we won't move, just that we won't fall over. So how to get to this place of rootedness, this place of peace that lets us bend and sway, but stay alive and with our leaves open to the sun? Paul says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. This week, this week of all weeks, I'd like to challenge all of us to try to do this. To take a week and see how it goes. See what that week is like. I don't think it's necessarily a straight line. Do this, and then God will do that. But as an experiment, we could see what does happen when we try to pray our way through the whole day. Paul counsels, present everything to God, pray about it, and give thanks. 
So maybe we, that could look like this. You wake up a little early and take 15 or 20 minutes to imagine the whole day ahead of you. And as you plan your day, lift it all up to God in prayer. At the end of the day, walk through it all again and give thanks for the ways you felt God present. Or instead of using waking and sleeping as a cue to pray, you could use your meals to remind you to lift up what's coming in the next few hours and to give thanks for what has already happened. Or you could go totally hardcore and use the alarm on your phone to remind you to pray every two hours. Or every 15 minutes, you know, whatever it takes. Um, I'm thinking about doing that, but I don't have like a nice alarm on my phone. So. Mm-hmm. Just a crazy one. Uh, but let's see what it feels like. Let's see what it feels like to do that, to pray and to give thanks for the whole day, every day. Let's see if anything changes or re- reveals itself. What can we expect at the end of the week? We might decide never to try that again. We, or we might find a new well of gratitude, a deeper calm, or even an unexpected connection with God, an experience. I think that when Paul tells the Philippians, and by extension us, that we should lift these things up, he's not saying it out of an attempt to make us better people or to somehow take away the pain of this life. Instead, he's sharing what works for him and how the mighty God, improbably made known to us in a little baby, can choose to bring us peace if we can find a way to stop, to pray, and to give thanks. My prayer is that God's spirit of peace will dwell with us this week with the people of Newtown, and with our entire nation, whether we have words to pray or only silence. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's have some time for reflection. And then our um, reflection question is, have you ever had a sense of God's peace in the middle of difficulty?